hope I can uh, give you um, a bit of an insight into some of the questions that uh, my lab is asking and how those have some maybe big picture consequences uh, along the lines of the sort of prime topic for uh, this uh, symposium, this colloquium having to deal with climate change. And um, uh, in fact, obviously the title of my presentation is climate change and something called, which I'll tell you more about, temperature dependent sex determination in turtles. So uh, basically what I'm gonna do is use this particular interesting system, uh, both the biological system as well as the organismal system to talk a bit about uh, implications of climate change, biological ones. And so what I'm gonna do with uh, respect to my presentation then today is start to tell you a little bit about turtles. You may or may not know about turtles, but I'll tell you a little bit uh, more about them. So basically introduce the, the study system in that regard, and then transition into uh, what I'm calling climate change issues, or in other words, um, how the biology of this particular system can give us insights into some of the consequences of changing climates and changing habitats. Uh, and then using specific examples about uh, research from my lab uh, in the past, currently, and where we might be going uh, into the future. And this is a colleague of mine, John Tucker, from the Illinois Natural History Survey, and this is one of uh, the turtles from one afternoon's uh, nesting event of red-eared sliders. So it's quite a, quite a haul there. All right, so what is a turtle? Well, I guess I'm gonna start off by saying it's sort of self-evident, right? There's no, <laughs> there's no mistaking a turtle for anything else, right? You see it, it's got uh, what I'm calling a unique shelled body. And what's really neat about it is it's got its shoulders and its pelvis tucked basically inside the rib cage. Don't do this at home, right? It's a pretty phenomenal sort of uh, event. And in fact, I even have a graduate student in my lab right now who's looking at the development and genetics of how the turtle got its shell. Uh, so turtles are characterized by that. And in fact, you find them in the fossil record, and I'll show you in a minute. Um, uh, a fossil turtle looks more or less like a modern turtle. So they're, they're pretty spectacular that way. Um, they're also characterized by having tremendous longevity. You probably know that as well. Uh, turtles are known for living a very long time. So they've got some really neat characteristics, including another one I'm going to talk to you about today. Where do turtles come from? Well, they're characterized as reptiles. And you might think of reptiles as things like snakes and lizards and so on. And that's all true uh, in terms of taxonomy. But interestingly, their closest living relatives are the archosaurs, that is, the birds and the crocs. So in other words, in terms of living organisms on Earth right now, their closest living relatives are crocodilians, sorry, alligators and crocs, and birds. And they're not quite so closely related. This is called a phylogenetic tree. They're not really quite so related, closely related to the lizards, which are the squamates, the lizards and snakes, and to Atara, which are lizard-like reptiles. And a bit more about the evolutionary history of these animals. We know from the fossils, and again, turtles fossilize very well, so this is really helpful, is that they've been around for on the order of 250 million years. So they've been around a very long time. And uh, it's not the greatest photo there, or uh, illustration, but that's an illustration of a turtle called Progenachilles uh, from the Triassic. It's one of the very earliest turtle fossils that we know from around 220 or so million years ago. And this artist's reconstruction essentially has it looking very much like a modern, almost like a common snapping turtle you'd see around here. All right? So turtles uh, look quite a bit like they did for um, a couple hundred million years or so. Uh, and they've obviously weathered a variety of different kinds of circumstances that have happened on Earth. Uh, continents moving, climates changing, all sorts of biota coming in and blinking out. They were here before the dinosaurs. They've been here now after them and so forth. They also, interestingly, play a major role in popular culture, and I'm giving you a smattering of those uh, examples here. You know them perhaps from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Uh, those who are old-time music fans might know them from Terrapin Station at the Grateful Dead album cover in the top, or from, uh, let's see if I can get this right. There we go. Books like Old Turtle, perhaps you've read that one, and, some of the others like Franklin and so on, and of course even in advertising like turtle wax and bicycle helmets, 
<clears throat> and so on. So uh, people generally throughout the world view turtles in a sort of uh, positive way in terms of their uh, role in culture in a variety of different uh, ways. They also play major roles throughout the globe uh, in a variety of different religions and mythologies, playing different roles in different sorts of stories, um, including those where the turtle is at the bottom supporting the rest of our cosmos. Uh, there are turtles all the way down, is one of the phrases. Uh, so they play an uh, important role, okay, in popular culture as well as in various uh, stories, religions, and mythologies at, at all sorts of different levels within this country and throughout the globe. And yet, for 250 million years, they have thrived. We seem to think they're important based on their role in our culture, mythologies, and religion. And yet, other than freshwater mollusks, even more so than what you may have heard about a lot of declining amphibians, turtles likely comprise the most endangered major group of animals on Earth. Roughly two-thirds to three-quarters of the species are on what is known as the IUCN red list, so they are globally imperiled in one way or another, the roughly 300 and so species. And it's not just as though it's somewhere else in the world. It's true even here, if you will, in our own backyard, and for a variety of different reasons. So this is true globally as well as locally. They play a role or are a source for food consumption, um, in the pet trade, so animals like this wood turtle are fairly common. You see them in the, in the pet trade. Other sources of declining populations and species include some of the classics like road kills, um, toxins, in some ways uh, cruel people who use them as target practice. Uh, it's probably the case, however, that loss of habitat is the primary source for loss of turtle populations. True for all sorts of organisms. Um, not just in this country, but throughout the world. And now we're adding this, right? Changes to our weather, changes to climate throughout uh, all parts um, of the globe. And, and frankly, it's not even just this aspect of climate change that is influencing these organisms. It, there are other elements of the way in which we interact with our environment that influenced the local thermal environments as well. So it's not just the weather. It's how we do our agronomy, how we do our clearing of forests for resources. It's, heck, how we build our cities as heat islands and the local environments within them. And even out here in the suburbs of Chicago, how we construct our subdivisions, where we build our houses, how we shape the land, right, our landscaping, all that changes the local thermal environments for these organisms, not necessarily in positive ways. So what my job today is to talk to you about how this changing thermal environment can have deleterious consequences for a group of animals that have been around for 250 million years and that are already imperiled by other things that we're doing on this earth. And I'm going to do this by illustrating uh, my point, focusing on just one of their traits, right? having to do with sex determination. We know that sex determination is a totally fundamental trait for organisms that have separate sexes. Right? How you produce males and females is crucial. If you don't have enough of one and the other, all bets are off for hanging around as a population or species. Right? But what's interesting about this fundamental organismal trait is how many different ways organisms have evolved to solve the problem. Now, the one you're most familiar with is this, whoops, this one here that we call genotypic sex determination. I call it GSD for short. And this is a group, grouping of sex determining mechanisms where essentially sex is determined right at conception by some genetic factors. And you're familiar with, right, in our species, we've got X and Y sex chromosomes. You inherit an X from your mom and an X from your dad. You're a female. You inherit the Y from your dad and next from your mom, you're a male. And that's basically determined right at conception. All right? And forevermore, there you are. All right? And there's a bunch of organisms that have that. In fact, in birds, it's the other way around. It's the females that are the heterogametic sex, we call it, and the males that are the ones with the, essentially the two X chromosomes and so on. So there's lots of organisms. In fact, the vast majority have some form of GSD. 
And we can contrast those kinds of mechanisms with the ones you're probably less familiar with called environmental sex determination, or ESD. And this is a group of mechanisms where there's some sort of environmental cue that the individuals experience during some discrete period after conception that permanently determines the sex of the individual. And there are a lot of different ways this comes about, and I'm going to show you a handful of them. So it's a rare mechanism compared to GSD, but the way in which, again, it's, it's um, manifested is a variety of different kinds of environmental cues, depending on the organisms, and all across the tree of life. So you can have plants like Atroplex here, four-winged saltbush where nutrient conditions can determine whether they differentiate as males or females, soil nutrient conditions. Things like this shrimp gamerous, where photoperiod determines where an individual becomes permanently a male or a female, long versus short. And then there's some like, uh, this is a great one, this is a nematode mermis. It's a nematode parasite of flies, actually of mosquitoes in particular. And individuals become males or females depending on how many of those parasites are within the mosquito itself. So crowding or density. And that's kind of true here with Bonellia. This is a marine echiured worm. Um, if, one of the, if one of them settles on the bottom of the ocean alone, it settles, it becomes a female. If other ones land on top of that one, they become males. So it's sort of, again, a kind of a crowding or density sort of thing. And then we have Manidia. There's a few fish and a whole bunch of reptiles, like the painted turtle here, where temperature is that environmental cue that permanently determines the sex of the individual. And for these, we call it temperature-dependent sex determination. And as an aside note, what's interesting is that in all of these cases, with the exception of the reptiles, we have a good idea of the adaptive significance. In other words, why they have this form of ESD. But the group in which it's most common, it happens to be reptiles, is pretty much the only group where we don't know why they do it. That is not the topic of what I'm talking about today, however. Let me illustrate what I mean when I say TSD, so that you can visualize this as we go today. So uh, if you just incubate the eggs of the animals, of these, if you think about it as that painted turtle, at a constant temperature, between, say, 20 and 40 C. So 20 is about, what, 68 Fahrenheit, and 40 is about, what, 102, right? Give you a sense of that if you don't think in degrees C. You can see with this black line, we call that a reaction norm, that temperatures that are cool produce 100% male offspring. Temperatures that are warm produce 100% female offspring. And then there's this really narrow range here delimited by those vertical dashed yellow lines where we get both males and females produced. So it's got a really super steep slope as you transition from, in this case, going from left to right, from all male to all female temperatures. In other words, this reaction norm pivots right about this temperature here where you get a 50-50 or a one-to-one -one sex ratio. And that temperature is called T-piv, or the pivotal temperature of sex determination. That's important for what I'm talk going to talk about later on uh, in this presentation. So we have this range of temperatures where you get both sexes produced and the pivotal temperature. <clears throat> and to further uh, illustrate that what I'm going to talk about today has some very um, basic science applications, so that's a lot of our motivation is to try to understand what's going on with this kind of a system. It has a lot of applied ones too that even go beyond the issues having to do with climate change. Many of the groups, as I've kind of hinted at already, that have some form of TSD are imperiled for various reasons throughout the globe. So all species of tortoises have TSD, and all of them are on the IUCN red list. Same with all seven species of sea turtles throughout the globe. Both species of tuatara. Tuatara, here's how bad a shape tuatara are in. <laughs> there are two species, and they occur on a few little tiny islands off the two main islands of New Zealand. That's the extent of their range. Right? And both species have TSD, and the only way to do good conservation and management programs is for us to understand the system so we can make sure we produce enough of the right sexes. And then there's some lizards like this Madagascar day gecko, which also have TSD, and are in trouble for pet trade reasons in that case. All right, so if we want to understand 
how this system might evolve in response to thermal, <laughs> thermal threats, it turns out that there's some scientific theories that can help guide us. And one of them has to do with how um, this sex determining mechanism influences the ratio of the number of male offspring to the number of female offspring. And it turns out this theory has shown us that there are several critical factors that can affect this sex ratio and therefore influence how this TSD might change or evolve. One of these traits of the three I'll show you is the sensitivity of embryonic sex determination to temperature. Right? How sensitive that is can influence whether individuals become male or female. And an example of this is that trait I mentioned right before is TPIV. So where that pivotal temperature is located along that temperature axis determines whether you get more or fewer females, right? So that trait could evolve in response to changing sex ratios and keep this species viable. Another way to keep temperatures in a range where you get both male and females produced is if the maternal choice of the thermal qualities of the nest site evolves to keep pace with changing thermal environments, right? So whether the mom puts her nest in a shady spot or out in the open sand, that's going to influence the temperatures that the babies experience as they develop. And therefore, if it has a genetic basis, it can evolve. And not just where moms nest, but when. Their phenology, when during the year they nest, can influence the thermal environment. You can be guaranteed right now that if a turtle hauled out of the water to dig a nest on the ground right here, she's going to have a hard time getting it through the frost line. Right? That nest thermal environment is going to be very different than it is two months from now in early June. Right? So when she chooses to nest can influence the nest thermal environment and therefore the sex ratio of the babies. So these three critical factors we need to understand if we want to know how this system can evolve in response to changing temperatures. And so my lab has set out two major challenges in the last decade or so um, to start to get a handle on uh, understanding the sort of evolutionary potential of TSD in response to climate change. And the first one is perhaps maybe self-evident, but we need to know if TSD is sensitive to our current climatic variation. We know what climatologists project for our changing climate in the future, but we also know that year to year our weather changes. So does that currently influence what happens in these populations? And then, depending on that answer, we also need to know what I'm calling the underpinnings of TSD. In other words, as I'll point out, the components that give them the potential to evolve. But I wouldn't have put up question two if the answer to this wasn't yes, but bear with me. Let me introduce the system I'll talk about today. My lab's worked on a variety of different uh, species, a lot of different turtles in particular, but not just turtles. Um, and the one we spent a lot of time on uh, for various reasons, is the painted turtle. It has a lot of really great traits that recommended as a study organism. Uh, obviously, it has TSD, or I wouldn't be talking about it here. It has a geographic range it, that, that makes it such that it occurs basically throughout North America. Uh, it's one of the most widely distributed turtles uh, in the world. It's not a sea turtle. And as a consequence, it occurs in a lot of different kinds of thermal environments. It's uh, relatively common, and therefore it's not an imperiled species, so we can do research so we're not uh, herding species that are already in trouble. Uh, it tends to nest on land, so it lives in the water, but it nests on land, and these nests are around five to 10 centimeters deep, two to four inches. And that's great because it means the nest temperatures are very tightly coupled then to the changes of air temperatures around it, right? So they're, and we've shown that, and I'll show you, prove that to you later today. But the eggs are laid uh, diurnally. These turtles nest uh, during daylight hours, typically during the month of June, although as I'll also show you, the nesting season's been pushed back into the middle of May now um, in the last quarter of a century and so on. But it's typically it's in June. And I mentioned that nest temperatures uh, can influence the sex of the offspring and that under ESD it happens during a discrete period of development. Well, in these animals with TSD, that turns out to be the middle one-third of embryonic development. And the typical developmental period is roughly 90 days or so in these turtles. And that means that uh, the climate that matters to them and influences the sex happens roughly during July. So it's July temperatures that should matter to these guys. 
And today I'll focus on just one of the populations that we're studying, one that's less than a two-hour drive from where you're sitting right now on the Mississippi River. Um, it's uh, near Thompson, Illinois, which is across the river from Clinton, Iowa. And it's a population we've been studying since 1988. And uh, I take groups of students out to, we call it turtle camp, so if I call it turtle camp, you know what I mean. Uh, we, we literally camp on this island in the Mississippi River. It's administered by the Army Corps of Engineers. It's within U.S. Fish and Wildlife um, uh, Refuge. Um, they're kind enough to let us uh, be out there. And I bring lots of students out every year, uh, all different ages and stages. Um, and one thing I want to show, though, is while that's a really romantic picture, well, okay, maybe that's just me, but it's a romantic picture of, of field work on an island in the Mississippi River, and it really, is a really beautiful sp place to do work. Um, the sharpest eyed among you might notice little black specks. <laughs> Those would be the insects. So while we do have a lot of fun and it is a really great place to do work, um, you wouldn't want to confuse this with the National Geographic Special. It's challenging work. And all the stuff, all the research results I'm going to talk to you about today absolutely could not have been done without the efforts of a lot of really super dedicated students. And many of these are from all different stages. As I mentioned before, this is just four of the different years' worth of students that I've had out there. So for example, this is my 1995 crew, and it wasn't a very big crew that year. But um, let's see, this was last year's crew, and this was the year before, and so on. So it's everything from high school students, um, from Chicago, Detroit, um, uh, Dallas, Des Moines, uh, rural areas, and so on, to uh, graduate students and postdocs. So, students from, and from throughout the world. Um, and so uh, any of you who might be interested in this particular possibility can talk to me afterward or shoot me an email as well. But anyway, they, they've done a lot of great work uh, uh, over the years. So let me tell you about some of that work. <clears throat> With respect to the things I'll uh, be focusing on today, we're really interested in the nesting biology uh, of these uh, animals. And so when the, the moms come out of the water to nest, we wait until they uh, choose their particular nest site. And once they're done, we grab the females. We mark them if they're not already permanently marked, which would have been marked by us, that is. Uh, we measure them for size. Uh, we take a blood sample for our sort of uh, hormone work and our genetic analyses that I'll mention. And then we release her to continue on her way. Uh, we then, and here's one of the high school students with me, uh, we excavate the nest, we count and weigh the eggs, so we get a sense of the reproductive uh, output, and we put them back in after we measure the nest and so on. And we also quantify the vegetation cover around the nest using uh, hemispherical photography and some computational analysis of those data. Get a sense of how shady the nest is, and you'll see why that's important later too. The next uh, thing we record is exactly where this nest is located, and we measure it from landmarks at this particular site, and here's Carrie and Dave, two of my students, doing that. And it turns out that we have to measure it to the exact centimeter. We cannot have any error because after a few days, these nests are so cryptic, you simply cannot tell where they are. And that's crucial because when we come back to get the nest in September <laughs> to retrieve those babies, if our measurements are off even by the tiniest amount, we cannot find that nest. And then that leads me to get upset, and they never like to see that. So they've learned to measure very precisely in the field. But the great thing about these painted turtles, they have a fairly unique trait uh, for turtles in that they do spend their entire uh, 90 days or so as embryos in that nest, and they hatch out of the eggs in late August and September. But here's the cool thing about it. Then they stay in the nest the entire winter. So right now, they're a painted turtle nest outside, right, five to 10 centimeters below the surface of the soil. And those babies are out of the eggs, waiting for the weather to get nice so they can head out to the water. But it also means they experience some really, really interesting temperatures over the winter, as you might imagine. And we've shown, them, in fact, that they can freeze solid and thaw out again and survive. And we're actually not quite sure how they do that. But it also means that we get complete sampling. We get all the babies on this island. Uh, we bring the turtles back to the lab. And in fact, tomorrow I will be excavating 11 nests at this site, by the way. Um, <clears throat> uh, the last one's from 2012. And we bring them back to the lab, like I will tomorrow, and we choose a subset for the sex determination analysis. We do other things with them as well. But, uh, and then we 
bring a bunch of them back to release too. Uh, while we're doing our particular field work, uh, this is a bit of an aside, but we've also done a lot of computational work, including database development, because we measure a ton of different things out of this field site. And in order to manage this, we've, um, with some of the computer science uh, students and high school students and undergrads, in fact, here's one of the high school students from Des Moines. Um, she's doing some, some of the programming and data entry. Uh, we have this big database, so it means that really smart people, people who are smarter than me, who come along later, they have really interesting questions. We may have already collected those data, and then they can just uh, analyze it. Whether, again, it's measurements of the environment or of the animals themselves or the genetics. Okay, some results. To that very first question, right, having to do with whether the turtles are currently sensitive to climatic variation. So let me walk you through this. I want you to leave this with three conclusions. So here's a plot, again, of that offspring sex ratio as percent male, right? just like I showed you in that other reaction norm, as a function now of the mean July air temperature. Right? That's the temperature during that middle third of development when sex is sensitive to temperature. And each point up here, the two-digit number, that's the last two digits of the year in which the study was done. And what's plotted is the sex ratio of all the offspring born in that given year. So for example, in 1992, 100% of the babies born were males. Right? And that was a pretty cold summer. So if you look at this line, this grayish line here, that's the best fit statistical line to the data points. It looks a lot like that black line I showed you earlier, right? So conclusion number one you can draw from this is that, yes, these turtles are sensitive. The sex ratio is sensitive to environmental variation. And it's just like the pattern we see in the lab when we incubate eggs at constant temperature. So even though temperatures in the wild fluctuate a lot, they show the exact same pattern in the wild. So that's really neat. All right? Conclusion number two is this temperature here, about 23.8. That is over, what is it, 80, no, 70 years. That's the overall grand mean July air temperature at this particular field site. And check this out. We go from there with the green dash line up to here and over. <laughs> Isn't that remarkable? It says over the last 70 years, basically, on average, you get about one boy for every one girl. That's really impressive. It means that the population, in a sense, is locally adapted. That climate might fluctuate one way or the other, but on average, you're going to get about one boy for every one girl. Very, very cool finding. So this is, again, 25-year study. Um, and the third thing I want you to notice from this is if you go back to this green line, look to the right and the left, go about a degree and a half. And what do you find? Well, huh. Huh. With only a degree and a half shift, either cooling or warming, the population goes from on average, one boy for every one girl, to on average, 100% male or 100% female. So yeah, point number three is, they are sensitive to climatic variation, but even more importantly, they are exquisitely sensitive. It takes only a small environmental excursion to massively shift the offspring sex ratio. All right, so the naysayers at this point would be like, it's hatchling sex ratio, what does that mean to the population. They're just babies. Turtles live a long time. Maybe over time things just work out. Maybe it doesn't really matter at the adult stage. And, and, and you would be wrong. So hopefully you weren't the naysayers. So this is a study. <clears throat> so these females mature. They take about six years to mature. And we've shown that if you look at the total number of female offspring released, and then you measure six to seven years later, when females are coming up to nest, the, you count the number of females who are nesting for the very first time in their life. We call them primiparous, first time reproducing. And you get this beautiful line. In other words, 
Years that produce lots of female offspring, six years later, they produce lots of first-time nesting females. So yeah, the influence of climate and predation on these nests, how many offspring you produce of a given sex, totally influences population structure. It's a huge effect. All right, so we've answered the first question in the affirmative. We now need to know if climate changes or how that local thermal environment changes, can these turtles keep pace? And to do so, we have a question or a problem, I suppose you could say. We want to ask about their evolutionary potential. So we need to know two things. We know, you need to know, essentially, the genetic underpinnings of a trait and the strength of natural selection acting on that trait. The product of those two numbers gives us the amount of evolutionary change. Right? That's sort of the verbal definition of evolutionary change. But we can put it in quantitative terms. So as scientists, we can measure actual things that are quantitative and get more precise predictions. And that's what's shown in this formula here. It's also known as the breeder's equation. And so one generation of evolutionary change, in other words, delta z bar here, that's the evolution part, is a product of the heritability of the trait and s, which is the selection coefficient, how strong natural selection is acting on that trait. So we know a lot with climate change about what S is. We know how strong the thermal environment should change and how strong that should influence sex ratio. That's the conundrum. What's the genetic basis of these traits? So that's what I'm going to finish up with today. I'm going to focus on three traits for you, tell you a little story about each one of these and what we've learned from focusing just on this one population of painted turtles. We'll start with that pivotal temperature, right? The thermal sensitivity of the developing embryos of their sex to temperature. That's the physiological trait. And then we'll talk about the two behavioral traits. The traditional way this heritability issue has been addressed is people go out to a really great habitat like this sand prairie here along the Mississippi River in northwestern Illinois and walk around it like St. Here and you hope you find a snapping turtle nest, or even better, you find her making that nest. <laughs> Although you wait till she's done because she's a snapping turtle. Um, uh, and then you have to be careful because in this particular case, she's doing it in the middle of a prickly pear cactus patch. So this was a challenging one. But the typical way we do it, have done it, is to go out, find these nests, collect the eggs, bring them back to the lab, incubate them in very constant thermal conditions, and then do some little bit of mathematical wizardry to estimate the heritability level. But there are some problems with that particular approach because it doesn't deal with some non-genetic factors that also can be transmitted by the moms. So there are other traits, and you know this from probably your own studies or from reading, that there are things that your mom can pass on to you that influence what you look like and behave like that have nothing to do with your genetics, right? These are these non-genetic maternal effects. And one of them that could influence sex ratio in these turtles is what the moms allocate to the eggs in terms of things like what we call sex steroid hormones, like testosterone and estradiol. So my lab's done some studies of turtle species that have TSD and of turtle species that have GSD and asked, do these steroid hormones vary? And in fact, it does seem to be you get a lot more testosterone in species like this snapping turtle that have TSD and orders of magnitude or an order of magnitude fewer in species like this smooth soft shell that have GSD. So yeah, I guess it's possible that maternal allocation of these steroid hormones could influence offspring sex ratio. And in fact, one of my former postdocs, Rachel Bowden, did a really neat study. Um, and it's based on this idea that Physiologically, we know testosterone can be converted by the enzyme aromatase to estradiol. She did a study in painted turtles where she measured the levels of estradiol and testosterone in the egg at the time the mom laid it. And then she measured what the sex ratio of the rest of the clutch was that that mom laid by incubating the eggs at the pivotal temperature. In other words, if moms allocated more versus less testosterone to estradiol, that could influence the sex ratio at this pivotal temperature. And sure enough, it seems to. So eggs in particular tended to have a lot more estradiol 
relative to testosterone, tended to produce these all-female um, clutches of eggs. So in order to get an accurate estimate of the inheritance, we have to somehow control uh, for this maternal effect. And we also need to control for the fact that we're incubating eggs at a constant temperature in the, in the lab when we know that's totally not true in the wild. So with that challenge in hand, um, my, my Turtle Camp crew uh, embarked on a study that took us, I think it's 12 years, um, to get a large enough sample size uh, to answer this particular question where we could control both for the thermal environment in the nest as well as the hormone environment transmitted by the moms. And I won't go into all the gory details, but it involved a lot of fun field work and a lot of fun lab work and a little bit of math at the end. All right, this is a busy slide, and I'm going to want you to, I, I put the details up there for those who might be particularly, you know, keen on it, but the point is what essentially we did, is we constructed a genealogy of these turtles in this population to know who's related to whom by using genetic markers. And in this way, in the same way you can with humans, right, you can construct how something's inherited, right? So that's essentially what we've done here. <clears throat> and what we find is that in fact, oh, I never described heritability, I'm sorry. Heritability ranges between zero and one. Maybe you knew that already. And the higher the heritability, the closer to one it is, that means more of that particular trait is transmitted from parent to offspring relative to a trait that has a lower heritability near zero. So to find that this TPIV trait, this thermal sensitivity, has a heritability of 0.35 in the wild is actually remarkable. That means that roughly a third of that trait is sort of faithfully transmitted from parent to offspring, right? Excluding the maternal effects, controlling for the fluctuating temperature effects. That's pretty neat. And it suggests that in the wild means that this particular trait could permit some evolutionary change of TSD. All right, so there's maybe some promise. It's not a huge heritability, but it's certainly not zero. What about the behavioral traits? What about nest site choice? Can moms control things? The first problem moms face, yeah, you can read that. I can't read that. Where shall I nest? It's not quite so simple, is it? Because I've already told you that the nest temperature that influences the offspring sex ratio occurs during the middle one-third of embryonic development. So if mom's nesting on June 1st, she has to pick a nest site where she can somehow pick some environmental trait that's going to allow her to have some predictability of what her nest temperature is going to be over a month later. And these are turtles. So how do they do this? What can they choose about the environment that might be a faithful predictor of that nest thermal environment? And that's where that vegetation cover trait comes in. Right? If they're nesting in an area where there's, say, trees and so on around, and I've told you already that they nest diurnally. In other words, they're not nocturnal nesters, so they're diurnal. They can see what the shade is like around them. They may be able to choose a nest site that's more or less, say, sunnier or shadier. And we've shown, and this is just an example from three different years, we've shown that, in fact, that does seem to be true. So if you measure the percent vegetation cover on the nest site on the day that the mom constructed that nest, it predicts the mean July nest temperature. So a month or so later, it's a strong predictor of that temperature. And it won't surprise you, right, that shadier nests are cooler. And that's true whether it was 1996, 1997, 1995, and so on. It's always that kind of negative slope, right? right maybe, <laughs> maybe that's proving the obvious, but nonetheless. What's even neater is that the amount of vegetation cover over that nest on the day it was laid, say June 1st, predicts what the sex ratio of the babies are when they hatch several months later. So it is a predictor. Shadier nests produce more boys than do sunnier nests. So maybe this vegetation cue is, or vegetation cover is a reliable cue for these moms to use. And one of the things we've shown is that individual females have particular preferences. So check this out. Here's an example of just six females from the population with their particular marks. It doesn't matter what these are. But look at this female. Each black dot represents 
a nest site choice of a female in a given year. So this is a several year study. So in one year, she chose that spot, another year that one, another year that one. Well, and this female chose that one, that one, and that one. This female chose that, 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 and so on. You can see that they cluster. Each female, year after year, seems to have the same kind of thermal preference. Now, each female is not the same as the other female, but if you will, within herself, her behavior is repeatable. That's cool, and that's in the wild again, not under artificial lab conditions. So this is the trait that natural selection could act on. It's consistent. So does it have a heritable basis? Right? Back to the lab, back to the field, blood samples from all these moms, reconstruct the genealogy, do a little math at the end, and man, over 12 years, 631 females measured, and a heritability of 0.04, which is huge, right? No, it's not huge. It's zero. It's basically zero, right? There's almost no heritable tendency for choosing nest sites based on vegetation cover. So unfortunately, this trait may constrain the evolution of TSD, right? It's certainly not going to be able to promote it based on what we've found or report here. Well, what about nesting phenology? If it's not where they nest, maybe it's when they nest. And we certainly know in terms of climate change, the ongoing climate change, that probably the most obvious phenotypic markers that scientists have measured throughout the globe have to do with breeding season. So we've seen it in birds where in a variety of different species, they're nesting earlier than they ever have before. And this is through all sorts of, again, studies throughout uh, the globe. Um, for frogs, they're beginning their spring calling seasons earlier. And again, this isn't just in one species. This is in a whole bunch. We've seen this in um, uh, angiosperms, right, flowering plants, with that first flowering in the spring, right? That's the part of their, crucial part of their reproduction. That's happening earlier around the globe and so on. Um, and even when other aspects important to the biology of populations, like the migratory behavior of things like butterflies, that's been happening earlier and actually presents some, some really horrific kinds of ecological mismatches as well. So what we wanted to know is, is this happening with turtles? And if it is, does it matter? So with a bunch of my colleagues, um, I couldn't study this many populations and species simultaneously. So I'm working with a bunch of colleagues who are studying different kinds of, or different species of turtles in North America in different localities from Nebraska, South Carolina, Illinois, and so on, to ask the question, uh, are these populations nesting earlier and earlier through time? So these are folks that have been studying turtles a long time in the field, like I have. And so, so you know, kinosternin are mud turtles, there are common snapping turtles that are around here, the painted turtle, and then the red-eared slider turtles in case you wanted to know. And what have we found? We have indeed found that just like basically all the other organisms, and maybe not a surprise, for the most part, turtles are nesting earlier than they ever have before. And one of our best examples is from my colleague uh, John Tucker's work, the guy I showed you earlier that was sitting in the cattle tank full of sliders, uh, is this work that uh, we began in the early 90s. This is in south central Illinois, near where the Illinois River's confluence with the Mississippi. And look at this. Back then, they were nesting. Uh, this Julian date, 150, is right around June 1st. And now look at this. In less than, what, 10 years or so, the onset of their breeding season has advanced roughly three weeks. That's how fast they're changing. And it's this total linear sort of change, although it is starting to flatten out now a bit, which is interesting, too. So yeah, they're definitely being affected. And we've even done some neat work at Turtle Camp on the painted turtles to show that how warm the previous winter is affects when the nesting season starts multiple months later. So if it's a warm winter, they tend to start nesting, to breed, you know, initiating the nesting season sooner. So they are nesting sooner. We have a mechanism for why they might be nesting sooner. But Using that same genealogical approach I showed you before, using genetic markers, it's not heritable. So just like nest site choice, the timing of nesting does not seem to be heritable. All right, we're getting very close now to the end. I've blazed through a lot of specific science. 
uh, telling you a little bit about the story. And now I want to bring those pieces together to maybe give you something, mm, I don't know, maybe more concrete to think about and to mull over. <clears throat> so at this point, we have to say, how, would these, how might these organisms respond to rapid climate or habitat changes? And with respect to the sex-determining mechanism, there are a handful of choices. And we've talked about these latter two here today, the thermal sensitivity and the nesting behavior. But historically, I suppose it's possible they could have simply evolved a new sex-determining mechanism. You think that's really super likely? They, they can't just, right? <laughs> let's, let's have sex chromosomes. Right? It doesn't work quite like that. It'd be great, but it doesn't. So it's not likely. And in fact, some of our analyses I haven't shown you today is that within turtles, the species that have GSD, and there's a small number of them, uh, when we trace back historically using the fossil record and the timing of those changes from TSD to GSD, every single one of those changes has happened during a global cooling event. None of them have happened during a global warming event like we're experiencing now. So probably not. Well, how about this one then, geographic range change? I suppose historically that would have been reasonable, right? We certainly know populations of turtles occur in places that not even 20,000 years ago were solid ice, right? Under glaciers. You know, we'd be pretty icy right now, too. So that's possible, but in this day and age, without anthropogenic assistance, probably not likely. I just don't see them crossing I-88. I just don't. Heading north. You know, and all the other interstates, and through all the other subdivisions and parking lots. Right? It's not going to happen. So are they going to face extinction? Well, one of the things we've shown, this is a, a graphic of the turtle camp nesting site at the main nesting beach. And if you look at the one on the left, it's divided into three colors. Exclude, don't, don't think about the black one. That's just our little road through it. Right? The, three, the red, yellow, and blue colors, the red ones are the areas where if a female nests, is going to produce all female offspring. The blue ones produce all boys. And the yellow ones produce both boys and girls. And if you look at the right, this gives you a sense maybe of how dire the situation is. With merely a two degree Fahrenheit change, that's about a one degree C change, right? Just that much is going to really radically change the thermal environment at this spot. Are there still places to produce boys? Of course. But it's a huge change, and it's only one degree change. So it's a pretty important problem. And what I want to do is put it in concrete, quantitative terms. All right? I've showed this breeder's equation before, and now we have the heritability number we can plunk in there. Let's just focus on that pivotal temperature change. Well, we know that in this northern part of the, uh, North America, a very middle-of-the-road prediction is that our typical July temperature should be about 4 degrees C warmer by the year 2100. Right? So that's very standard prediction. Some are more than that, some are a little less than that, but that's pretty much in the middle. And we know from the pivotal temperature trait, I pointed out that its heritability was about 0.35, but what I didn't mention to you is that that's only for clutches that produce both boys and girls simultaneously. And that's only about a third of the nest, so we really need to divide that 0.35 by 3, which means that that functional heritability is really about 0.12. And if you put those two numbers in and solve for S, that means you get 33.33, which I'm sure is totally clear to all of you, right? No, it's not. Well, OK, if it is, great. But let me put it in terms of something known as a standard deviation, right? If you put it in terms of standard deviations, right, how much that trait has to change from where it is now to where it needs to be to keep pace with climate change that's predicted, it's going to shift roughly 30 standard deviations from its current spot. As biologists, even in microbes, we do not know of a single trait in any organism, even under experimental extreme conditions, that can evolve that fast for that long. All right? So I can tell you words. Now I can show you mathematically. It's not possible. Briefly, some of our future directions. So I just got 
thank God, two new NSF grants, National Science Foundation grants. Um, and I will be looking for lots and lots of students. And we are studying, it starts this summer, uh, seven populations of painted turtles that are distributed across, well, the western two-thirds of the country. And we have one, four that we've studied for a long time. Those are the black stars uh, along the Rio Grande in New Mexico and Bosque del Apache National Wildlife Refuge. This one along the Columbia River between um, uh, Washington and Oregon. And a wildlife refuge, a turtle camp one here in northwestern Illinois and in western Nebraska at Crescent Lake Wildlife Refuge, National Wildlife Refuge. And we have three new ones here in northern Minnesota, south central Kansas, and then this one up in northern Idaho. So these are all in locations that have very distinct kinds of climates, both currently and how they're projected to change. And we're going to ask, given that we know New Mexico is way warmer, say, than northern Minnesota, how is it that there are perfectly viable painted turtle populations right now in those locations? How have they solved the climate problem? And we hope that'll give us some insights into how they might um, change in response to long-term climate changes in their current locations. Uh, and then this paper uh, just came out a few days ago, actually last Friday, where we now have a sequence of the painted turtle genome, the very first turtle to have its genome sequence. And now, uh, and that's actually one of our turtles from the Washington population. Um, so that's kind of exciting. Uh, and we now have a really great standard where we can do all sorts of, I think, really neat um, uh, molecular and genomic work to really start to get a handle on uh, what genes and pathways are involved in the sex, determining, uh, sex determination process and, again, more specifically, uh, how they might change in response to um, thermal changes, be it habitat or climate. So let me leave you with some conclusions. Uh, we've shown that these animals uh, with TSD are sensitive to climatic variation that we experience now. Very, very exquisitely so. It doesn't take much to shift their sex ratio. And that sex ratio is really important for population stability. I've also shown that this pivotal temperature and some other measures of thermal sensitivity uh, seem to have some heritable variation. And we're really going to pursue this further, including through the genomic work to start to identify some of the genes that are involved uh, that are in this, this process. Uh, on the behavior side, it's not quite so clear. Um, females seem to only have a modest capacity to manipulate the offspring sex ratio, at least in this response to sex ratio selection. Um, but, but we're going to continue to study that, particularly in all those seven populations I mentioned. Um, and same with this onset of the nesting season, another trait that seems to have a fairly minimal um, genetic basis, but that nonetheless is changing rapidly within these populations. Um, and again, um, one of the things that uh, I, I want to do is to, uh, of course, thank the turtles you know, it's hot, um, but uh, they've been good to us, and they're uh, really fun to work with. Uh, and that's also been true with um, all the students that I've worked with over the years, um, almost 200 of them now in the last uh, uh, 20 years, and lots of funding uh, to make this kind of thing happen. Um, and I'm happy to take questions now or in the Q&A afterward. And um, you can also feel free to shoot me um, an email if you have questions or if you're interested in things like Turtle Camp or Iowa State or something along those lines. So again, thank you very much and uh, happy to take questions. <clears throat> and I should uh, point out that uh, I was born with, uh, without a lot of hearing, and so uh, you might not know it, but I, I try, I read lips mostly. So if you're in the back in a dark area and I can't see your lips, I probably won't, I can probably tell you're talking, but I can't hear you. So um, if you can come down to the microphone, that would be uh, great. Or catch me afterward. Finding this pattern with a, you found this pattern with a lot of the different um, painted turtles. Have you found any a common pattern with um, other species of turtles or other species in general? With the, the effect of the environment on the sex ratio, yes, we have. Uh, I meant I, I 
you know, time limitation to pretty much focus on one species today. Uh, but, but at Turtle Camp, there are roughly a dozen species of turtles, and so we're also studying uh, ornate box turtles, common snapping turtles, blandings turtles, and soft shells, and so on and so forth. And we see the same thing um, uh, in the ones that have TSD. There are definitely shifts in the sex ratio, but the painted turtles are the ones that have the really great population sizes and really good numbers, so we can uh, do incredibly confident statistics in, in math. So I do admittedly focus on them for that reason. Uh, but same patterns, so yeah, good question. How do you think sea turtles are going to be affected by this? I think actually that's a great question. It's about uh, questions about sea turtles. I think maybe you heard it, uh, how they're going to be affected. Uh, so um, I don't work with sea turtles. Uh, there are so many people <laughs> working with sea turtles that um, it's a crowded field. Uh, but my colleagues are finding that uh, there seems to be fairly minimal impact on them. And uh, they think part of the reason uh, has to do with the fact that all right, this is going to be my interpretation of what they're finding. <clears throat> so they may disagree. Uh, but I think what they're finding is that because uh, sea levels are rising and the water is coming farther inland, that that's actually keeping the nest temperatures cooler than the air temperatures uh, would otherwise make them. And plus, as you can probably gather, sea turtles are fairly large and they dig relatively deep nests, which are also a little bit more thermally insulated from general sort of weather changes. So they don't seem to be seeing a lot of an effect. The effects that they are seeing are actually coming from the construction of uh, large buildings along the coast, mm -hmm. which are shading the nest. So, but the climate part, part, they don't seem to be finding much, which is interesting. Thank yeah. you. Uh, I just had a question about the female nesting sites. If it's not hereditary, how do they like do you have any idea how like, females choose their nesting sites? That's a great question. So if, if I'm claiming that it's not hereditary, then how is it that they're going about doing it? Uh, and, and we don't necessarily, we don't have an answer to that. We don't have uh, any indication, however, that they're choosing a nest site based on the, the spot that they were actually born. We do know that the moms, I, I probably should have pointed this out, these moms come back year after year to that same nesting beach that I illustrated at the end. So they like the same sort of beach, but that thing's a couple of football fields long, and it's not like they're coming to the same little tiny part each time. Um, but again, how, how they do this, why they choose a particular site, and why they consistently like a particular vegetation cover, uh, uh, I don't have a good answer. Um, but like I said, we are continuing to study it because I'm not fully convinced that it's not heritable, even though that's what our data say. Somehow it seems like it has to be. So, so I don't know the answer. Okay. So we'll take these two questions and then we'll move to the main gym. If you guys have more questions, you could ask them then, okay? Uh, do you think that studying why the turtles are getting, um, why the turtles originally evolved TSD would be beneficial to helping them survive in some way? I do, and I think that's a great question too. And that's the, the tricky one it's, it's been a lot of things. It's been disappointing because there's been a lot of what I would say really smart, creative biologists that have tried to tackle that question of what we call the adaptive significance of TSD using all sorts of approaches, all sorts of organisms, and almost no one has succeeded. Uh, and I include myself in that. Um, but one of my recent postdocs, Dan Warner, did a really neat study with these dragons. They're a kind of lizard in Australia. I mean, be clear of that. Uh, where, anyway, he had a really great uh, sort of approach that suggested um, an adaptive explanation for TSD in these uh, Jackie dragons. We're doing the same sort of thing uh, using hormone manipulations of sex and temperature uh, in these painted turtles, and we're going to try to rear them up, uh, which is a long-term project. I hope I'm still alive when it ends. Um, and, and to try to ask the question, if we can make a male at a temperature that normally makes females, and if that male's not as good in terms of producing offspring um, as a male from a typical male-only temperature and do the same thing for females, I think that'll tell us a lot about the adaptive significance. But frankly, you want to know my real, my opinion is that I think it's been around for 250 million years and it works. It's not clear to me that it's necessarily bad. 
even though you can see it's susceptible to environmental change, I think for these guys, they live a long time and they've just, if you will, <laughs> they've weathered global climate change before. But will they this time? I don't know. But no, it's a great question and, and we want to know the answer. But it's a long-term problem. All right, to thank answer. you. Yeah. Okay, so we were wondering what got you interested in turtles in the first place? Ooh, what got me interested in turtles? Well, I, I have to give a shout out to my mom who let me bring home all sorts of stuff <laughs> um, that I found around wherever we lived. We moved around a lot, but uh, you name it, whether it was crickets or worms or garter snakes and so on. So spending a lot of time outside and, and that kind of stuff really kind of got me jazzed uh, about biology in the general sense. But, um, but with the turtles, it was, uh, okay, I like lizards more than turtles. <laughs> All right, I have confession. Um, but, uh, uh, but turtles rock, too. Uh, and, and, uh, but the thing about turtles, I think, I guess when I, when I did my master's work and, and uh, got to see them and finding the nest out in the wild, I'm telling you, I've seen thousands of turtles nest and I still get excited every time, particularly when I see it through somebody else's eyes and it's their first time. So what got me interested in them? I guess they're really great for answering scientific questions. And it's kind of hard to put into words. I mean, who else has its rib cage outside its body cavity? I, I mean, I just, they're just really cool. I don't know. I'm sorry. I, I'm, it's like a biophilia thing, right? I just love them. They're cool. But that's a great question. Yeah. <laughs>